Y'all hear all that noise in the background? No. Let me turn my volume up. Can you guys hear me good? Yeah. All right, bet. All right, everyone. As you can see, I'm joined by D and Q. D, thanks for joining us today. How you doing? I'm good, bro. I'm over, over across that water right now. I'm in Spain. I'm in Barcelona, Bandelona area in Spain. My first time here, uh, Western Europe. No snow, nice weather, so loving it. Yeah, so it's a six-hour difference from where we are basically at. Um, no snow. You said first time in Spain. Uh, where else, you've also played where overseas? I've been in China, in Beijing with the Beijing Ducks. I've been in Lithuania with the uh, with Lithuania Redis team, and now here in Spain with uh, they call it Pina, but it's Joe Vincent, Badalona, like the club here. Okay. Okay. What a lot of similarities in the three? No, no. All three different, three different countries, uh, three different parts of the world. China is going to be the biggest culture shock for us for back home. Uh, Lithuania is Eastern Europe, and and Spain is Western Europe. So, you know, like Lithuania was part of Russia for a long time, and it's it's Eastern, so it's a lot colder. Um, just a lot different than Spain. Spain is, is a lot warmer. It's right on the coast, uh, right on the water. So a lot, it's a lot different in all three big differences. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Uh, what about in terms of basketball? Yeah, all three different in basketball too. There's similarities in Europe in general, just how they, how the game goes and the rules and everything like that. But each, each league is, is a lot different. Um, Spain, Spain is known as the best country in term, outside of the U.S. in terms for just their domestic league. So most times um, a country will have like a domestic league within their country. And then a certain amount of teams will be in premier leagues like Champions League, Euro League, which is known as the best league outside of the NBA, and then uh, Euro Cup. So Spain has a total of 12 to 14 teams in these premier teams versus a country like Lithuania, which only had maybe two or three. Okay. So top to bottom, it's, it's a lot better competition. Uh, as I've been told, as you know, it's a lot better. It's uh, a lot, the, the clubs are higher, higher budget, so they can afford players like, uh, Meritage who play with the Bulls, they can afford, you know, high these high paint, these high yeah, yeah. players. Makes sense. Um, what would you say? Which which club would it was the toughest to kind of translate to understand, or do they all have a translator? Definitely China was the toughest. The coach spoke English, but it was tough because everything he said, it was like double the time. Everything he said was translated into Chinese. Yeah. So Every film session, every practice, every time he yelled, every time he stopped, anything, it was like it took double the time because another person had to translate it. Once again, that was the biggest culture shock being in China. I was only there for a couple of months, but Q actually got a chance to come out and see it, practice. He sat around, so Q can speak on it too. But that was going to – China's like the biggest difference. And what I've learned in like, I guess, in countries like Lithuania and, and Spain is that they can speak English, but they they don't. They prefer to just speak their native language. And right. Lithuania, I believe English was the second language, and then second or third language, and then in Spain, all, same thing, second or third language. So you know, so people just prefer to speak their their native native language, and it's a lot easier. Right. Q, what do you think about China? Um, personally, I thought it was pretty crazy. I mean, like D said. Uh, it's definitely going to have the biggest culture shock in terms of just the language barriers. Um, you know, you don't really know anybody over there. Actually, you don't know anybody over there except yeah. the person you're with. Food, so the food, food different. Uh, culture. It was insane, man. But it was a good experience just seeing a different side of the world. Yeah. Obviously. Uh, 13 hour time difference. Yeah. yeah. So China it was crazy. Way different. Yeah. What, what about food? Like, China was kind of like, well, they were, you know, does Spain and Lithuania, do they have 
off-brand American food type things. Hey, tell them, D, what happened, man. <laughs> uh, Q, got, Q, Q got sick. He wanted to – what you eat from McDonald's? He got, like, some – some. so I don't know if everybody knows, but every McDonald's in each country is different. Like, for right. example, you know, you go to McDonald's and, and – Italy, you'll get, you'll be able to get like some Italian type dishes at, at the McDonald's. So I don't know why, but they had chicken wings in China and Q decided he wanted, <laughs> he wanted to eat some chicken wings in China. And he ended up, like, I woke up to Q like in the middle of the night, all sick, crying. Hey, Q, yeah. Q is probably the loudest puker I've ever heard. Bro, of. I've never, I've I was never, in the other room with bad, the door man. shut, door shut. And I just hear like somebody screaming. So I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, I, I feel I, so bad. I heard like, you gotta get out of here, bro. Yeah, I got a weak stomach, man. I've heard Q puke before, and I was with someone else, and my buddy came in and he was just like, Is he like okay? Okay. Like I feel like something's really wrong. And I was like, bro, I don't know. Like it's so loud. It was a lot. Yeah. But, no, and then in, in Spain, uh Spain and, and, and Lithuania is, is is a lot more similar to home. You know, they got McDonald's, KFC, you know, they got all the, the same stuff we got for the most part. Mm-hmm. But then they also have their their own their own stuff here where, you know, own restaurants, I guess like chain restaurants in these yeah. countries. Right. Uh, different stuff like that. Spain, like I haven't been cooking here yet, so I've been getting, you know, a lot of food that you would get back home, like. They got like KFC, Papa John's. Or I've been eating bad, but hopefully, you know, here like the stores are a lot different. They don't have any. I haven't seen a single. Actually, I have seen, but it's not very many American brands. Like the shit. Like I, I talked to someone in the store, and they said like the biggest difference between like Spain and the U.S. in terms of the stores, like Americans are so addicted to sugar. Yeah. But like, bro, in the cereal aisle, they had. Special K, like the weekend, like the cereals you would never eat. The cereals, yeah, raisin brand, <laughs> yeah, bro, like yeah, raisin brand, like everything, like with no sugar, zero sugar. So yeah, the healthy stuff. Yeah, like I, I barely got. I just have like fruits and veggies in the fridge and like some eggs. So it's gonna be it's gonna be hard to uh, cook. I'm not a very good cook, but need some time to learn something new, I guess. Right. So transitioning um, to the NBA, you got drafted by the Celtics. So you spent time with the Celtics, the Rockets, the Sixers, and then you're with, in training camp with the Lakers. So a lot of good teams, especially thinking of the past five to 10 years, those are some of the best teams that have been in the NBA, you know, conference finals, all that stuff. Um, which team had the, I guess, craziest philosophies to understand and which team was like the easiest and how was like different different each different team kind of different um I'm ter- in terms of you know just like culture and all that I would say I would say the most difficult philosophies was not even difficult but different than everybody else Philly was doing like a lot of stuff that was different um, they had a they had coined I think the coach had coined a term, uh, the coach at the time he had coined a term like Batman and Robin, and they called Joel uh, Batman, and they called the the guard Robin. So, long story short, what they wanted to do was take away threes in the NBA. So, if somebody like it was on you to contain the drive, but at at the bare minimum, you want to push that drive round it out so someone is not getting a direct drive to the rim. But there was no help from the perimeter. Okay. When, the, when when a guy would drive into the lane, the perimeter would go out, defenders. Because as you know, a lot of times people drive and kick, drive and kick, drive and kick. That's how you get open threes. So the coach there, he he told he talked about like, I like our chances with a guard, somebody trying to finish over a 7-2 center. Okay. So what they what they had what they did, and, and it ended up, it worked really well. And and actually it's like a lot of teams are doing it now. But it worked really well because most guys, when they see that big body in there, they want to kick it out anyway. And a lot of times we're taught to drive and kick, drive and kick anyway. So it's like a habit, you know. And so when you drive in there and you have to fit, you have to shoot over a 7-2 center and you mm-hmm. can't – because if you pass, you had like Robert Covington, you had um, Jimmy Butler. Like the next year you had, you know, um, Ben Simmons. They're, they're on their way out already. 
So right. as you're driving and passing this way, I'm on my way that way too, just like a cornerback almost. And so a lot they, that's how Ben gets a lot of his steals, a lot of the dunks, is because that was something they they taught there. Um, but every place has been every place has been different. I've gotten to learn and absorb like a lot of information from a lot of great players, not only on the teams, but players I played against, not only that. Um, players I just sat and watched do their warm-ups playing the game. So just trying to be a sponge, take everything in, uh, you know, just going in with the mentality that, you know, you know nothing. And there's a, like a lot of room to grow and to improve and, and just watch. So I've been very observant in my NBA time down to like how guys treat other people, down to how they, how they prepare, how they, you know, do the warm-up, how they shoot, how their feet are set. You know how they flick the all, all the little details are 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 very important. So try to pay attention to those. Yeah, definitely. And uh, you know, you, like you said, you play with a lot of great players: Ben, Joel, Jimmy Butler, Chris Paul, James Harden, LeBron for a training camp. Um, did, was there similarities in like their work ethics? Like, could you kind of see, you know? You see James obviously put up triple doubles with 40s. You see LeBron, obviously, you know, best player in the league, all that kind of thing. Like, were you like, okay, it makes sense because they put in the work, all that kind of stuff? I think everybody has their own routines. Everybody has their own stuff that makes them feel, uh, you know, game ready, confident, prepared to, to go out and compete on a high level. I think the biggest thing is, like, you see the work, you see the purpose in the work, but a lot of those guys have already – put in their, put in their, you know, their heavy duty hours, their heavy, heavy lifting. So, you know, summertime is going to be the time where you see a lot of the skill development. I think if you can also accumulate skill during the season, that's going to be vital. Um, certain, there's certain NBA coaches and trainers and stuff like that, that are, you know, more known for their skill development. Like Los Angeles had Phil Handy. Bill Handy, you know, did a lot of stuff with LeBron before practice, you know, all pregame, all that stuff. So LeBron was constantly getting better. Um, but like I said, everybody had their own own routine that makes them feel good and everything like that. But um, there, there's there's similarities all across the board, um, for sure, for sure. Like, yeah, guys just – guys just. but I guess what I wanted to mention on that is, like, Kobe Bryant talked about it too. He said, you know – we, we know about Kobe's story. We know about, you know, how obsessed he was with the game. We know about his work ethic. You know, they talked about how he would get up at 4 a.m., go to the gym, you know, do certain things. He had so many times that he went and put in work. So eventually he just started to overlap people. And what I mean by that is, like, by his fifth or sixth summer, he was saying, there's no work you can do to catch up to me because I'm already too far gone. So it's right. the same thing there. It's like James Harden and those guys, LeBron, all those guys that are great. Now they're at the point where they're just putting in low impact, consistent work, uh, purposeful. You know, it's all – it's not as hard, not as much poundings because they're already so far gone. They already did the time where they would, you know, do the 4 a.m.s and, right. and the extra before, the after. So a lot of times the guys that are working the hardest in terms of – you know, all the pounding, jumping and running and all that stuff, playing are the are gonna be the young guys because those are the guys that are trying to play That's catch right. up. You know? Right, right. Makes sense. Q, you got any questions? Yeah, I have a couple of brief questions for you, D. Did you have a moment in the NBA where it was kind of like um like wow, I'm in the NBA? Like a wake up moment, like <laughs> maybe you're going up against one of the top players in training camp where you just subbed into a game, you got cooked. Was there a moment in the NBA where you're just like, dang, I'm really here. Like, I got to wake up. Man, I mean, I had a lot of I had a lot of moments where, you know, I was like, wow, you know, it's real. Like, I worked for this. I put the work in and now I'm here. I got to perform. I got to be professional. I got to do my job and, and have fun with it. But I would say my training camp in Houston – you know, you guys, I used to text you guys all the time, like, yeah, like, uh, you know, I'm guarding CB3 full court. I'm guarding James Harden full court. Mm -hmm. and, and I just seen, we see all the videos of, of them cooking people online. We see all yeah. the, you know, all the, all the film, all the NBA posts, all the stuff. And they, all, we see everything they've done. And here I am picking these dudes up full court, getting steals, dunking, you know, making some noise. And so 
That yeah. definitely made me feel confident. I worked really hard, but a lot of times, you know, as a young guy, you know, you don't really see the the results because you don't play a lot in the games. And so, you know, right. when I was able to like have a good training camp, uh, perform well, um, make some noise, earn my respect, earn my stripes from my teammates and stuff like that, that made me feel good. But the best training camp I ever had was in Philly, and it was getting ugly. It was getting I was doing my thing. I was doing my thing in Philly because I had already passed that time where I've gotten some some NBA time on the court with when I was on a two way with the uh, with Houston. I had already gotten on the NBA court. I felt confident. I put in a lot a lot of work at in Houston, a lot of hard work. And so when I went to Philly, the different culture, uh, you know, I was in great shape. Um, I, I was just ready. I was just ready. And so training camp practices. Uh, scrimmages, all that stuff. Like the, they, they know my name. You know, they, they, they respected me. I earned, I earned everything. So um, I played as hard as I could. I showed up early. I stayed late. Um, I came back at night. Like I was just, de- I dedicated everything to that grind. And so, you know, it was, it was a fun process. It was a very fun process. But Philly training camps. I had two training camps. I had three training camps in Philly because I did a summer league training camp with them and. Every training camp, they was like, man, he can go. So yeah. I think in Philly, in Philly, like, it was one time where where uh, coach was like, I hit a couple shots, was killing, getting in the lane at E, just dishing diamond. And I was doing my thing. And we were like the third team. It was like me and a bunch of, you know, guys that were going to play in the G League, guys on exhibit 10s, two ways. And we were beating the starters. And coach is like, is anybody going to guard him? Is anybody going to go? You know, you know, how <laughs> yeah. So, I think at that moment, when I heard Coach talking about me, talking to his, you know, the starters, guys that are first team on NBA, MVP candidates, the future of the NBA, mm-hmm. uh, Coach is like, can anybody stop him? You know, when I heard Coach saying that, I'm like, you know, I'm I like, like you belong, you belong. I felt like I was like that. So, yeah, uh, I think, too, one other side note is I used to play my teammates a lot in one-on-one. Mm-hmm. I, put, I would always challenge all my teammates to one-on-one after practice or shooting drills, too. But in one-on-one, you know, I'm playing against guys that are, you know, elite defenders or, you know, guys that are way bigger than me. Like, I was playing Joel and beat in one-on-one. And – or we'd play, like, uh, almost like a King of the Hill or Chicago type of one-on-one, and I would win, not hit crazy shots. And, and it was like – that definitely helped me feel confident, too. Helped me feel confident. And I, I would always play them when I was in a slump or when I wasn't playing well, I would ask to play them because I would always break my slump kind of doing that. Nice, bro. Yeah, my last question for you, bro. Um, in your opinion, we all know you're a student of the game. You watch a lot of basketball. So who is your MVP of the season so far? MVP of the season so far? Mm-hmm. That's tough. Obviously, LeBron is the front runner. I think the bigs, Jokic and Joel Embiid, are, you know, they're doing some crazy stuff. They're going crazy. Right. But I feel like people, I mean, Dallas is not winning. So I think if Dallas can turn it around, make the playoffs, be a playoff team, be almost like a top five team in the West, I think people are going to start talking about Luka. Yeah. You know, because he, he's always like a triple-double guy For sure. um, leading his team. I think they'll start talking about him. I'm trying to think of a sleeper. I'm going to be honest. A sleeper is going to be James Harden. I mean, yeah, he's putting he, up ridiculous numbers. His, he's putting up crazy numbers. Like, He's putting up double-digit assists almost every game. Leads the league in assists. Yep. He does? Yeah, he leads yeah, the league Yeah, bro, James Harden, James Harden is going to be a sleeper. Like, I feel like with three superstars on the team, they won't look that direction, and they won't care because they're going to be, you know, a team that's fighting for a championship. But I think James Harden should be in the contention because, I mean, he took that team. They were already good. And he just made them better. Now he's, he's getting almost a triple-double every game. Yep doing his thing i think that's a, i think that was the smartest decision for them to for make james? james no i mean for james them to make james the one though and kyrie the two because that's so weird to me it is, so weird. but like james but james is more willing at, to be past pass, yeah uh, and kyrie, kyrie is a crazy one-on-one player so mm-hmm. yeah james james passes the ball a lot i mean yeah i mean it's a great move 
they figured it out. Steve Nash figured it out fast. And he did. Those, that group, they figured it out quick. And, I mean, they're going to have some games where they lose. That's just basketball. But I could see them going to the finals and, and competing. And in a seven-game series, when guys are on islands, mm-hmm. gonna be, it's going to be scary. Yep. Yeah. Um, it's going to be tough to have a defensive liability on the game against them, for sure. <laughs> So who do you think – who do y'all think goes to the finals? Or, like, early final predictions? Um, I think this new Achilles injury to AD could oh, be – very... is, is, it, is it official? Yeah, like, he's out for, like, a month. Oh, and not... it's not, but we saw what happened when KD came back quick on an Achilles. He ruptured it. So, really? like, I think they're going to be very cautious with him. And AD's very injury-prone to begin with. So if it just keeps bothering him, yeah. I think the Lakers could still go to the Western Conference Finals maybe, but I think their finals chances are out the door. Um, and I think if if the Nets are healthy and play bas- their type of basketball, there's no one in the East that could beat them. And if the Lakers are banged up, I honestly think the Jazz right now. Like nothing the Clippers are doing really makes me think that they'll be better. The Nuggets aren't as good. The Mavericks aren't even in the playoffs. Like – the Jazz are just – like someone said this the other day, and it kind of makes sense. They're kind of playing like how the Tim Duncan, Tony Parker Spurs used to play. Mm-hmm. Great defense, oh, move the ball man. very well. And Do like – but, but with the modern-day NBA, there are games where they only score 80 points and that won't cut it. So, I don't know. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Like the West could be very interesting. I think if AD is healthy, though, the Lakers go. Yeah. I agree. I think that, I mean, the Jazz, do you think the Jazz are just on a hot streak? They're riding a wave right now, or do you think this has longevity? Yeah, I, I think, personally, I think the Jazz are just riding a hot wave right now. Like, there's no way they can sustain this for a whole season. Even though they're playing well, they're playing without Mike Conley, too. I just don't see them sustaining it, especially if they're trying to make a postseason run. Like, you, you have to have two to three superstars to win a title. And I don't think Clarkson or Royce O'Neal or Rudy Gobert have that in them to just sustain a whole postseason run and get to a championship series and win in a seven-game series. There's no way they beat the Nets. I would say, like, I mean, we see this a lot. Like, Cleveland was just hot. Cleveland was hot, like. And they beat the Nets. Like, oh, Cleveland, Cleveland, Cleveland. Yeah, Cleveland was hot. Not only that, we've seen times where Memphis, where John Moran has been hot and they've taken down the top dogs. So I think, you know, that's why guys like LeBron, they they know they don't worry too much because they know, you know, that things will always kind of even yeah. out. Teams, teams will, you know, it's a lot of gas, you know, a lot of gas. And Jazz are a great team. They got, you know, a lot of great players, Donovan, uh, so Rudy. But- yeah. Got a great team. In the West right now, excluding the Lakers in a seven game series at home, the Jazz can beat the Suns in a seven game series 100%. The Jazz could beat the Trailblazers. Not saying they 100% would, but oh, like, no, bro. They're, prob- they're probably the betting favorite in all these series other than the Clippers. They would beat the Spurs. They would probably beat the Nuggets. Golden State, they've been up and down, so who knows? Like, other than the Clippers and the Lakers in a seven-game series, they would probably be favored in every series right now. Yeah, at the moment, yeah. I, I would agree with that. You know? I think I think if Portland can get CJ back healthy, then they're going to be a sleeper team in the West. I too. just don't – Portland doesn't play any defense. And you got to be the Nets to not play defense. Like, the, you have to yeah. literally – like, the Net. The, there's only one team in the past 20 years to win an NBA title – that's not top five defensive efficiency. And that was the Warriors when they had KD and all them. And they didn't, oh, right. they didn't need to be because they scored 130 a game. So, like, mm-hmm. I think that's the problem with the Trailblazers and always will be. But they are – I mean, them not being the eight seed will definitely make them better this year. You know, they don't have to go that crazy route to win it all. So You mean the Jazz? I'm talking about the Trailblazers, though. Oh, if yeah. they are able to get in. So the Jazz are number one right now in the West? Yeah. By a game and a half. If the Jazz can, if the Jazz can finish top three, because since Donovan's been there in their playoff time, they've never been in the top three, correct? Yeah, last year they were the they usually like the fourth or fifth seed, like around that area. They were the sixth seed last year. Yeah, if they can get in that top, 
just have an easier path. They may, you know, I mean, they they always have to fight, fight, fight. Just right. to, I mean, like you see the games last year with Denver, like those games yeah. were crazy. Yeah, mm-hmm. like every 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 series for them is like that, and they can't. They got to have some series where they kind of, you know, just beat up on the competition a little bit. If they somehow could get the one seed, that's like their pack because you'd have the Lakers and Clippers play <laughs> second round against each other, and then you get to play someone else and then you also get the eight seed but i mean i wouldn't want to play golden state as the one seed right now just no. Steph. if Steph goes off like you never know with them they got a yeah, bunch of chances the warriors play hard on defense too they do and i mean they they still have like steve kerr all those coaches like everyone's still you know they know how to win championships so that's not you gotta easy. respect them for sure yeah it's not an easy ride. somebody says Steph don't pass no more <laughs> i wouldn't but <laughs> it says Steph don't be passing no more uh, you know, fam- famous Los on Twitter, he's always – he's, like, riding with the Warriors. So, he's, like – I was looking at his tweets. He says, Steph, don't pass no more. Oh. <laughs> That's funny. Um, all right, let's transition to next topic. So, the other week – or it was about a, maybe a month ago or longer, Deshaun Watson requested a trade. And uh, some people, like Brett Favre, I saw, he said, like, you're making this much money. You got to – just shut your mouth and play. You can't be requesting trades. Um, some other people said some stuff. Other people said, agreed with Deshaun. It was like, I get out of Houston too. And then J.J. Watt asked to be um, released, and he's released within the next two days. So um, what was your guys' kind of viewpoint on this whole situation? Um, and kind of like, it's funny because like all three, James Harden was in a similar situation. All three guys are in Houston. Something must be wrong in their water that all everyone's trying to leave. But <laughs> James requested a trade. Under. And, you know, he had to do the whole thing where he was late to training camp and then all that. Mm-hmm. But uh, he ended up getting traded. Um, a lot of people had mixed feelings about that one. I think more so just the way he went about it. But what was your guys' feelings on this overall situation, I guess? <laughs> I mean, I'll go first. I, my thing was when I saw the shine – I already knew what the narrative would be. Um, I already knew, you know, they would they would paint they would paint a certain picture. It'd be the picture that you mentioned that was, you know, you're getting paid so much, you need to just shut up and play, or you know that that kind of narrative. I had a feeling that would be it. But then I thought it was super interesting when I seen JJ Watt. I'm like, okay, let's see what the narrative will be here. And because JJ Watt is very well respected. He's earned that, you know. What I mean, he's a he's a great person, a great player, from what I see. But it's it's when you start thinking about these different narratives, you know, we see the same thing in the in the NBA. Like I'm sure, like if a if a if a guy, um, I don't know, like JJ Reddick, Kyle Korver, or even Steph Curry. Like if Steph Curry said, you know, I gave everything to this Warriors team, I want to be traded. I think the narrative is just so much different than you know, a guy like KD, LeBron, Kyrie, guys that don't have that, uh, you know, like America's sweetheart sort of rep, like people, people, you know, view them as that. So now it was, it was super interesting to see, uh, I guess my viewpoint with Deshaun is, well, in general, I just think this is the trend in sports. Like another case Mm -hmm. I saw today is Blake. Blake said he ain't, he ain't suiting up no more. He said, don't, don't. Blake is not even suiting up until they figure something out. So it's just like, I started thinking, I'm like, dang, I feel like these owners, GMs, you know, front office guys are going to start making examples of these people. Like, you don't want to be here. You know, I I feel like they're going to figure out a a way to penalize these people so much because this is becoming too big of a trend, I will say, um, in general, players just deciding they don't want to be somewhere and they don't have to be there. And like the fines – aren't enough because they're still getting paid so much money. Right. I will say this, though. One huge difference, I think, in the J.J. Watt situation and the Deshaun Watson situation. So, J.J. Watt, if they released him by a certain date, they owe him $0. And he's on the last year of his contract. And to be honest, he kind of sucks now. So, like, him coming back, it doesn't really benefit the team that much. He kind of sucks. Deshaun's situation, he just signed a max contract extension. So they're yeah. kind of, so like I, I'm speaking more so of the owners. Like honestly, though, like I would never say like if that's how he feels. And Houston's front office is maybe the most 
messed up front office in football. So, like, I would tell him, yeah, you need to get out of there. But I also probably wouldn't have told him to sign that contract last year because he should have tried to get out last year. But, you know, I do think – I agree with you. It is a a trend now. And, and, you know, right or wrong, it is a trend. All these players are holding more power than they used to 10 years – I mean, even 10 years ago. And I think owners are, like, definitely – hate. I mean, they obviously hate this because – I mean, this is the first time we've ever really seen players have power over the owners. So, yeah. which I don't, I mean, I kind of like, but it does, I mean, in some situations though, it does get too much. I agree with that, but I do yeah. like Deshaun though. I mean, he has the right to say, I want to be out of here. And on top of it to back Deshaun even more, like you traded Deandre Hopkins and top three receiver yeah. in the league. You traded all these guys. You have no draft picks. You have no future. You have nothing. So the Texans might be better off just getting all these draft picks and getting rid of Deshaun Watson and rebuilding. So, like, I don't, you know, and like you said, though, I mean, these guys can get fined, whatever. They get, they're, they're all on max contracts. So these fines are maybe one hundredth of every paycheck that they get. So they don't care that much. Yeah. I mean, from my perspective, like, say if you had a player and he doesn't want to play for your team, like, he doesn't want to be there. And so, like, yeah, he's going to come because he's a professional, he's going to come, show up, do his job. But it's just a different element to it, you know. When you actually want to be somewhere and you love it, and and you you know you put everything you have into it, and then some. That's you know a championship recipe. But when you got a guy just showing up to work every day because he's required to, I just don't think it's good for anybody. Really, I think what I mean, I, it's a lesson to be learned here. Like, what can these teams do to like keep the players happy? Like, but why would it keep your star player happy? Right. To your first thing, though, I mean, it's I mean, the James Harden situation, the Rockets are like eight and four since he left and they're not necessarily better. He just didn't want to be there. And, you know, so like that's a a perfect example of, you know, the recipe just wasn't there. He didn't want to be there. So making him go show up, you guys aren't going to make the playoffs. You're still going to pay James Harden forty one million dollars and everyone's just going to be miserable. So what's the point of keeping him around? So um to i you know i don't know i i do think with the social media age and everything though like players are more and i think this is everywhere i think this is quarterbacks in the nfl i think this is top players in the nba i I think they know more first off so they know that they hold the power which Mm -hmm. so they can kind of do whatever they want so deshaun can chill here knowing that like if i don't show up the texans just look awful because they like you said why would you not make me the happiest person in this organization? And I do think that, like, it's just kind of like everyone – everyone nowadays is just, you know, you you ask, they do now. So these players come up and, you know, I'm the number one player. I don't want to be here. Let me out. That kind of thing. Yeah. I, I feel like, like you said, more knowledge too. Like, because the players hold a certain level of leverage – Yeah. Um, their agents can put a certain something in their contracts For out sure. um, clauses and different things that can also benefit them. Like if my player gets hurt, he still gets all this money guaranteed. You know right. what I mean? So mm-hmm. there's certain things that that's, that comes with the players now, but I guess when you, when you write up a contract, that's what comes with it. I mean, when everybody, when all parties sign the contract that I will say, you know, when parties sign the contract and, and it's tough, it's tough for sure. Like, you I know, think that's the only that's the on. only thing the Texans have right now is just look. You just signed a max extension with us. Like, we, you know, you were in that room. We didn't force you to sign that. But I do honestly think the JJ Watt situation kind of helps Deshaun a little bit because he yeah. can walk in and be like, "Look, you let him go. I understand our contract situations were different, but he asked, you did. I mean, I I did everything for this team." Our head coach traded every draft pick, every DeAndre Hopkins. Like, who the hell trades DeAndre Hopkins? And you got to let me walk now. Like, I, I don't want to be here. I, I really wonder what's going on internally there to make everybody want to leave. Just imagine the players that want to leave that can't – they don't have the, the, they don't have the leverage. Yeah. Well, probably, there's, the there's, vibes are probably terrible there. Yeah. There's <laughs> former players. There's former players like Andre Johnson. He's like – Mr. Texan like he was like I think their first major star to ever play because the Houston Texans haven't been around for a while or that long and he was just like I mean this has been a normal thing the organization has ran so poorly so like 
when you hear that, like, you got to side with, like, Brett Favre's take of, like, uh, just play. It's like, yeah, I mean, it's easy to say. Was but it like, Brett look, Favre moving around? Yeah, yeah Brett Favre, Favre retired, yeah. like, three different times. But also, like, <laughs> that was everyone, easy. No. everyone who says something is a retired guy who has nothing to lose slash – they would probably not do the same in the situation. Like, they would probably be on Deshaun's side if he was playing. But now he's retired. He's like, no, I'm going to play this retired card that I would have done this, this, and that. But, like, I just don't understand why the, the Texans have no um, kind of plan right now. So, yeah, this would be, like, their only plan. They tarnish their future trading all those picks and yes. getting rid of the I honestly don't, like, what is the tech? I don't know. Like, I don't know what the tech, like you said, the Texans playing. Like, they just lost J.J. Watt, their, their, their guy. They're about to yeah. lose Deshaun. And if they, if they don't lose Deshaun, that means they're going to force him to stay. And it's not going to be pretty. He doesn't like, if they're like, there. you ain't going nowhere, you're staying here, it's going yeah. to be so think, toxic. And I just think J.J. Watt got let off the hook easier than Deshaun because of, like you guys said, his tenure there. Like, he, he's a tenure vet. And yeah. he, don't, he donated so much money to the community. And then, like you said, Deshaun just signed that new max contract. So it's kind of like, yeah. bro, you signed here. You got to kind of put up with it now. So yeah, I do. I agree with you on that. But, but you know, so what would y'all do if y'all were Deshaun? Would you stay or would you be no. like, I'm trying to get out? Here too. So you're trying to get out. I'm trying no. to get out, man. The way that I've been treated when I wanted to get out, when we could have kept it under the table, and on top of that, the way you, other than giving me money, which you have to do because there's a salary cap and everything. Like, you haven't done anything for me to better my career. So, true. let me out. Let me do something else. And, you know, we – I heard J.J. Watt say that, I was like, damn. Yeah, it's a wrap. And J.J. Watt is – yeah. J.J. Watt's 100% on Deshaun's side. Like, he's basically no. like, you need to get out. So You know what he said? Like, I'm sorry, we're wasting your prime or something Yeah, like that. yeah. So, like oh, – so I like I said, I think this JJ Watt situation will help him because if Deshaun, if they don't trade Deshaun Watson, JJ Watt will speak up and be like, let this man go. Like this is horrible what you guys are doing to him. But would you would you stay or leave? Because we got like 30 seconds left. I'm gone. If I'm yeah. if I'm Deshaun, I'm out of there. I'm going to get me a ring somewhere, bro. He can go yeah. to San Fran. He can go anywhere. I agree. I think Sorry. yeah, I think Welcome. I think that is hundred percent. I mean, honestly, who really cares about the white 80 year old reporter anyways. So, but all right. We done. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. Thank you guys for having me. Yeah, thank you. D. I'll Hello, come on everybody. again very soon. All right. We'll see everyone later. All right.